but not everyone saw it as a golden opportunity. When he said to me what he was trying to do, I burst out laughing. I said, don't be ridiculous. I must admit, when they told me about it, I thought, what a terrible idea. I thought, God, a big gathering of, of all those whalers, and, and it was the 80s, remember, there was so much crap around. I thought, oh God, it'll be, it'll be all them, you know, all pouncing around in their white trousers. So you'd say, oh, well, it's in, in July sometime, not quite sure where it's going to be. Don't know if it'll be on the telly. And by the way, you can only probably play for about 20 minutes. You won't get a contract, but we want you on the TV. And you have to pay for it all yourselves. And it was like, fuck off. And as if that wasn't enough, Geldof was to boldly go where no man or television station had gone before. An all-day transatlantic live TV extravaganza when satellite technology was still in its infancy. Baby, Only one man could make it work. Geldof flew to New York to see Mike Mitchell who had just produced the television coverage of the LA Olympics. He and I discussed what it is that he wanted to accomplish. And, and when I went there, I was very skeptical. He had originally wanted to do a concert between uh, London and New York. Um, I had just come off the games and said I really wasn't interested in that. But if you want to do a worldwide event, um, I'm in. They called it the Global Jukebox, and it was getting bigger by the minute. Wembley would start at noon. America would join in five hours later. The shows would be beamed all around the world via satellite, with other countries joining in. It was a round-the-clock operation. I took my little house, and we moved in desks, and we ordered more telephone lines, and we simply just worked out of that house for the show. And I couldn't even go to the bathroom during the day. That's how bad it was. America was the leading expert in the satellite technology that Geldof needed for the global jukebox. So everything hinged on getting the American show right. Harvey Goldsmith pinned his hopes on the legendary West Coast promoter, Bill Graham. Bill Graham was an irascible, angry, difficult, control freak and you either did it his way or you didn't he also was an amazing amazingly creative guy and he really put music on the map in America you know Bill it was an imposing figure he always ruled by intimidation uh, he was as tough uh, promoter as there's ever been produced on the history of the planet I would imagine uh, you know he was a bad motherfucker Graham's sidekick and fall guy was fellow promoter Larry Magid. Everything about Bill was drama. You knew that there was going to be a timed explosion uh, at, at some point, um, and it be became part of the, the ritual with Bill. So far, Geldof and Goldsmith had few stars on board, no venue in America, or even at that point a broadcaster in either country. All they had was the bluff of Bob. And then they could say, great, we took part in the biggest TV broadcast ever, now f off. One of the very early impossibilities that Bob threw at me was that he wanted to put this out on TV. And he then said, I want the whole concert on TV. And I said, that ain't gonna happen. There was only one organisation that could pull it off. Good old auntie. You simply couldn't believe that you'd bring together Queen, U2, uh, Paul McCartney, you name it. I mean, you know, Rod Stewart, yes, he'll be there too. Phil Collins, oh, he'll be in Concord. All this was sort of, uh, was being told me. And I was sort of saying, yes, yes, that's all, you know, that's really interesting. But I didn't believe it, to be honest. Bob thumped the table and said, no, I want the whole show out, all 12 hours of it, and we're going to do America, so I want that out as well. I want the whole day sorted out, and he just stormed out the room. I just assumed they would. 
Um, so why not? And I, I suppose it's sort of that naivete. It didn't strike me as that big a deal. And then suddenly, Bob walked in the door again and he said, I want an answer by Tuesday. <laughs> he shot out the door. I've been having second thoughts about this and I'd like to hear more from the music department about the idea. Well, what exactly do you want? Well, it'll be mainly music, George. Well, frankly, to me, this savours too much of a gimmick. I'm in favour of the experiment. For two weeks, Geldof and Goldsmith held their breath. Then finally, a breakthrough. I called Bob and said, um, I just had a call from Roger and he thinks he might be doing it. He said, good, is he going to do the whole lot? <laughs> OK wasn't good enough. It was the whole ball of works or nothing. With only six weeks to go before transmission, the news was broken to BBC staff. Bearing in mind it was the height of the summer and most of the outside broadcast vehicles were already booked for other things, you've got all sorts of sporting activities going on. Just, I thought, it's going to be an absolute nightmare. The biggest misgivings were voiced by the team who had the unenviable task of presenting the show. The men behind the Anorak's favourite music programme from the late night graveyard slot, the whistle test. I was on holiday, in fact, I remember putting down the telephone and going out and lying in the meadow outside the house and staring up at the sky and just feeling nauseous with terror. The thing you have to remember about Whistle Test is that we were a very humble little programme. We were 40 minutes once a week occasionally on BBC Two. And here we were doing one of the biggest shows the BBC had ever done. It was like asking uh, BBC Radio Cleck Heaton to do the Olympic Games. You know, we really weren't up to it. If that wasn't enough of a problem, the new boy on the show was ideologically opposed to the whole thing. I could see that whilst it was a worthy gesture by uh, a number of pop stars, there had to be behind it something more substantial to back it up. I wanted the governments to do something about it. They're the people who had the real power. Geldof had his work cut out, getting the European networks on board. I told them from the very beginning about this, and the precondition for any of the wealthier Western countries is that they run a telethon. Iceland don't want to do a telethon. Geldof's global jukebox dream wasn't going to plan. America's can-do culture was rapidly becoming can't-do. The nation that put a man on the moon didn't believe that this show was technically possible. We were literally laughed out of all three networks' offices. The Olympics, we used two satellites, one feed, one location to a world feed. Live Aid, 16 satellites, eight locations, all interactive feed for 16 hours. In today's terms, it would be like saying, let's do a concert on the moon. You saw the whole of the moon. After weeks of wrangling, ABC finally agreed to broadcast not the whole day, but a three-hour special with Philadelphia as the American venue. They had the venues and the TV networks, but few stars confirmed. Geldof and Goldsmith had no choice. They had to go public. We had a press conference at Wembley to announce the whole thing, which was a bit of a farce, really, because we actually didn't have anybody confirmed at that point <laughs> at all. We were scribbling names down as Bob was going, because we had to go at 12 o'clock, I seem to remember, on Radio 1. Richard Skinner here talking to you live from Wembley Stadium, where a very important announcement is about to be made. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to announce today that as Band-Aid's first part of their relief program comes to an end, and as our younger sister, USA for Africa, begin their relief program today, Band-Aid start the second part of their program by announcing live aid. The people taking part in alphabetical order will be Brian Adams, Adam Ant, the Boomtown Rats, David Bowie, the Cars.
Most of the press conference was spent with bits of paper flying about from various different people, to Bob, back to Bob, to Bob, uh, to uh, Bernard and so on. And from me saying, no, this act hasn't confirmed and he would just be flicking them off the table. I would have been flicking it away because it would have been a distraction because it was going to happen. It was going to happen that Mick was going to somehow square things with Keith and that was all going to happen and Bob Dylan was going to show up and it was going to be wonderful. That, that was in my head. There wasn't a second's doubt as I did it, but afterwards I'd be sick with fear. Queen. Queen's Shade, manager, Santana, Jim Beach, Paul suddenly Simon, interrupted the proceedings. Lines, Spandau Ballet. I suddenly got yanked out. It was Jim Beach Style calling from New Zealand. Sting, and he said, what the hell is this all about? He said, why are you announcing Queen? I said, because Bob told me they were doing it. And he said, what? <laughs> so I kind of, I said, look, we're right in the middle of the press conference. He said, you better not announce Queen. I, so I coughed a bit and said, because he'd already done it. The Pretenders, Queen... Bands who were no longer together were amazed to hear they were reforming, especially for live aid. Status quo. I got a call from Pete Townsend just as they were going into the press conference that I thought sort of intimated to me that he was at least interested in playing. Not with The Who, but he was interested in playing. Marsha came in with her bit of paper to say that Pete Townsend had agreed to do it threw it at Bob, Bob read it and announced that the Who were getting back together again. And about five minutes ago, we heard some wonderful news, and that is that the Who, one of the greatest bands ever in rock music, are reforming specifically for this event. What the fuck are you talking about? Uh, it was just really bizarre. It was really, really bizarre. The phones light up completely <laughs> mentally from the pair of them. What the fuck do you think you're doing? I don't even speak to him. I'm not going to do it. I think you will agree that we have more or less, without a doubt, in fact, the most important people over the last 20 years. And I can also tell you that the remaining half dozen or so huge bands in the world are at the moment trying to clear their desks. And we will let you know over the next three weeks who's in and who's out of that remaining half dozen. I went through the list and, like, literally, uh, the, the journalists were sort of gasped, have you got so-and-so? Yes, yes. And they were kind of freaking out. And, uh, and I said, Brian Ferry, so-and-so. Next minute, like, the phone rang about two hours later, as Brian said, I never agreed to do it. And I said, well, hey, dude, you know, pull out. As the Wembley press conference made clear, Geldof's brusque, domineering personality was driving Live Aid forward while pushing old friends aside. It was becoming very obvious that Midge was being pushed into the background. So Bob said, OK, then, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll read one band out and Midge can read the other, and so on and so on. Richard Skinner here talking to you live from Wembley Stadium, where a very important... I tuned into Radio 1, all sort of excited that at last Midge was going to get, you know, his, his uh, due for doing so much work and get to be a part of things again. And I sat and Bob just did the whole... It was as if Midge wasn't there. ..on two continents. I'll um, read out the list of people taking part. The conference kicked off without me. I felt a bit miffed. I was a bit left out. I was standing talking to um, Gary Kemp and Adam Ant. And before I knew it, a kind of partition had been closed and the press launch was happening next door. So there's the entire uh, Band Aid trustees all sitting there with Bob spouting off about who he was going to get. And I was in with them and I'm thinking, hold on a second, what's happened to me? Where have I gone? Well, I mean, he had nothing to do with Live Aid. I mean, that's it. That's the reality of it. And I would have said, well, if he wants to do something, he can, but it was never suggested to me, and I would have thought it redundant, really. I know it's not about egos, and it's not about personalities, but it was, I think it was quite hard for Midge to take. And to his credit, he never said anything publicly. <laughs> Despite bruised egos behind the scenes, all pop fans cared about was that the biggest concert in history was going to happen in just four weeks. The people taking part in alphabetical order will be Brian Adams, Adam Ant, Boomtown Rats, I'm just waiting for the Ks to come along. And it's a Nick Kershaw, and I'm there. Jones, <laughs> Judas Priest, Nick Kershaw, Chris Christopherson, Huey Lewis and the News. I mean, I wouldn't go if it was just the 